Good morning, and at this time, Sergeant's in charge of recording. If you can please start your recordings. PC recording underway. Cloud recording has started. Backup has started. Thank you. And Sergeant Martinez, if you'd be able to start with your opening. Thank you. Good morning, and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Civil and Human Rights. At this time, would all panelists please turn on their video? To minimize disruption, please silence your electronic devices. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so via email at the following address, testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that's testimony at council.nyc.gov. Thank you for your cooperation. Mr. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. My name is Matthew Eugene, and I'm the chair of the Civil and Human Rights Committee. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on addressing online hate and radicalization. Before we begin, uh, I, I will do that after I was going to acknowledge my colleagues in government. I don't know who is here, but I see uh, Brad Lander. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brad. Always there. Thank you. And acknowledge uh, the other colleagues as soon as I, I see them on this. In a matter of few short decades, the internet has uh, completely transformed the way the world is. Social media in particular has gained significant popularity with over 3.48 billion users in 2019, representing the half of the world's population. While social media platforms has greatly facilitated the ability of individuals, businesses, and various social groups to share and exchange information. This new technology has also enabled the spread of misinformation and hateful or violent ideologies. The internet structure of social media platforms allows individuals and groups to reach a wider audience, making it a powerful tool for promoting and coordinating hate. In a survey conducted by the Anti-Defamation League this year, 44% of Americans surveyed said they experienced some form of online hate or discrimination, while 35% said they were targeted online in relation to their sexual orientation, religion, race, ethnicity, gender identity, or disability. There has also been substantial growth in the number of hate groups in the United States. The South Southern Poverty Law Center, an organization that tracks hate groups and reported annual increases in the number of such groups, particularly since the 2016. Last year, the center reported a record high in the number of hate groups a 30% increase and since 2014. This increase has also occurred with an increase in hate crimes and incidents of domestic terrorism. Contrastingly, prior to 2016, the number of hate groups had been falling for three years. These findings were recently echoed by the testimony of the FBI director, Christopher A. Ray, before the House of Homeland Security Committee in September. It is clear that online hate poses a very clear and present danger to the public safety and social cohesion. The ever extending reach of social media and other online platforms brings with it increasing accessibility to helpful individuals and groups looking to spread their ideologies and cite violence and increase recruitment to their disturbing and dangerous causes. While 
there have been attempts to address increase in online hate and radicalization, the novelty of social media and other online platforms has meant that government attempt to address such issues have lagged considerably. This hearing represents an opportunity for this council, city agencies, advocates and social media platform alike to explore and improve the ways in which society addresses and responds to the proliferation of online hate and radicalization. I'd like to thank the committee staff, Belki Mirik, senior counsel to the committee, Ron UV, policy analyst, and Neville Finance Analyst. And I would like also to thank my staff, Melissa Wilson. And I would be remiss also if I didn't take an opportunity to thank all the wonderful people from the staff of the City Council who work hard to make the uh, public hearing, the remote public hearing possible. To all of you, thank you so very much. And I want to acknowledge also we have been joined by Council Member John, Council Member Baron. Thank you so very much. And with this, I would like I would like to turn it over now to the Council to go over some procedural items and administer the oath. Thank you. I'm Elsie Smary, Counsel to the Civil and Human Rights Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, when you will be unmuted by the host. I'll be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will also be announcing who the next panelist will be in order. I will call, I will call you individually when it's your turn to speak. As a reminder, please submit your written testimony to testimony at council.nyc.gov. We will now turn to public testimony. The first panelist to give testimony will be Lydia Bates, representing the Southern Poverty Law Center. She'll be followed by Scott Richmond from the Anti-Defamation League, then Michael Cohen from the Simon Wiesenthal Center. I would like to now welcome Lydia Bates, to begin her testimony. Thank you and good morning. My name is Lydia Bates. I use she, her pronouns and I'm a senior research analyst at the Southern Poverty Law Center or SPLC. We appreciate the invitation to testify before you and I'm pleased to share the views of the SPLC Action Fund with regards to addressing online hate and radicalization. Founded in 1971, SPLC's mission is to be a catalyst for racial justice in the South and beyond working in partnerships with communities to dismantle white supremacy, strengthen intersectional movements, and advance the human rights of all people. The newly founded SPLC Action Fund partners with SPLC to advocate for policies and legislation that promote equality and strive to eradicate white supremacy. Earlier this year, as life moved to online spaces to help slow the spread of the coronavirus, an estimated 70 million American children completed their school year online away from the structure and oversight provided in classrooms and during extracurricular activities. In late August, the United States Census Bureau revealed that nearly 93% of households with school-aged children are reporting some form of distance learning from COVID-19. This unprecedented increase in time spent online creates a uniquely challenging environment in which to continue the years long fight against online radicalization. Risk of online radicalization and exposure to harmful content is further compounded by distracted parents and caregivers who are all working from home, um, a lack of social engagement and interactions with diverse people, beliefs and experiences and uncertainty and loss leading many young people and adults alike to rely on simplistic and conspiratorial answers for an ongoing pandemic that has impacted almost every aspect of daily life. While removing extremists from social media platforms and building algorithms that redirect people away from extremist content rabbit holes can have some positive impact on widespread susceptibility to radicalization, building awareness of and resiliency to radicalizing extremist content at home and in learning environments is an important prong in a successful multifaceted approach to online radicalization. SPLC in partnership with the Polarization and Extremism Research Innovation Lab 
an American university recently published a guide to help parents and caregivers build that resiliency against extremism by educating them to recognize the signs of online radicalization in young people who are oftentimes the targets of such far right propaganda and by empowering them to intervene. Parents and caregivers are the most crucial frontline defense against hate and radicalization. The guide helps them learn to engage with young people in their lives over difficult topics in the news, uh, responsibly embrace their identity so as to contextualize it in an appreciation of diverse identities and experiences, and listen to the language young people are using to recognize problematic online platforms they may be um, using. An imperative piece of helping to build this resiliency is improving digital literacy in both adults and young people. SPLC's Teaching Tolerance Department has developed a comprehensive framework through which educators, parents, and young people can develop digital and civic liter literacy skills. And most importantly, it is incumbent upon each of us to challenge hate in all of its forms. These are only some of the most important steps we can take and the committee can support towards building our collective strength against online radicalization. The written statement we've submitted has some more in-depth details on these strategies and many other approaches that can work to help mitigate harm while strengthening community and care in young people's lives. Thank you very much for holding this hearing and for focusing your time and attention on this important topic. I hope you are all able to stay safe and healthy right now. Thank you very much, Ms. Lindia. Thank you so very much. Uh, uh, in your testimony, you mentioned that uh, your organization has published a guide. Could you give us some more detail? Or could, can you share with us uh, you know, you, what you have done exactly to get the information, how you get the information you know, uh, to create this guide? Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, please. Sure. So the guide was recently developed, um, like I said, in partnership with the Polarization, Extremism and Research Innovation Lab at American University. Um, and they uh, are kind of a new um, organization within American University that is looking for innovative ways to build this resiliency and interrupt um, radicalization in its many different manifestations. Um, so the guide, I mean, the information that we're, we're drawing from is from years of, of research and experience in, within our department and also um, from that, the Innovation Lab, which is headed by Cynthia Miller Idris. Um, and it was published um, back in June of this year um, to help parents really understand um, and recognize the risks that online radicalization presents and has presented for years, but also the increased risk uh, that comes with everything moving to online spaces and um, less oversight from parents and caregivers and um, kind of the interruption of support networks that children and young people uh, across the globe are currently experiencing. So it really looks at the, the different dimensions that COVID-19 presents uh, in terms of online radicalization. And um, the guide lives on the SPLC website. So that's splcenter.org slash peril. So but did, did, did you conduct any uh, outreach or any interview with people who have been affected by uh, uh, online hate, uh, discrimination, just mm -hmm. to have the feeling, the thought? Yes. Um, so peril has several consultants um, parents and caregivers, um, people who were radicalized and then went through the de-radicalization process, um, parents of people who have been the target of hate, uh, former extremis extremists who are now parents and trying to raise um, children who don't turn to hate. Um, and we've had several webinars with several of those speakers and, and others who have expertise um, as parents, former extremists, um, researchers such as myself and Cynthia and my colleagues in the um, intelligence project. So uh, yes, reached out to, to many, many different um, uh, people with expertise in these areas. From your knowledge, which group or population or category of people uh, that is more affected by online uh, hate or radicalization or discrimination? Is there any special group like 
children, immigrant, you know, people because of their religion, because of your sex, their sex, any groups, special group that you think that have been uh, more impacted or affected by this uh, crisis? Um, I, I would say that um, everyone has to be aware of online radicalization and everyone has a susceptibility to being exposed to that extremist content. Children in particular um, are, are susceptible um, just because they haven't built the, the skills and knowledge to kind of parse through information that might be coming their way that they might um, run into on various social media platforms. Um, and, and they haven't been building the skills and knowledge to discern between something that's false and might be extremist and also might be taking advantage of them and potentially predatory um, and, and information that's coming from sound sources. Um, so children in particular have a susceptibility to, to these um, online radicalization. You know that, uh, and I, I keep saying that all the time, I know that all of us, we know that New York City is home to so many people from all over the world, speaking several languages. And some of them, they, they have uh, challenges because uh, English is not their first language. But in your guide, what languages uh, do you uh, translate, did you translate or your organization translate the, the guide to several languages as much as possible? or it is only in English? Uh, that is a great question. And as far as I'm aware, it is only in English. Um, but I think that that's a, a great recommendation to translate it into, into different languages. But anyway, I want to commend you and your organization for what you have been doing uh, to bring awareness to people, to let them know, you know the, the different detail of this crisis, is this a social crisis, society crisis, and to inform them how to handle what to do to handle this situation. And I understand also translating your guide in different languages may require also resources, you know? Mm. It may not be something that would, could be easy for your organization, but uh, that would be a good thing, and you know, to consider also. And now we are facing a situation, you know, unprecedented situation, COVID crisis that changed everything, everything. And what do you believe that you will do to modify your approach to this uh, situation, uh, hate crime, online radicalization? Are you, are you going to continue to do the same thing you have been doing? I mean, your organization is going to continue to do the same thing. Uh, will your organization do some modification to make sure that you do an efficient job as you have been doing to reach out people because now we cannot get a gathering and group, we cannot reach out people. Everything is by remote. Is there any changes that you will bring to your uh, way of addressing online crime or radicalization or discrimination? Absolutely. Um, I would say Probably the, the biggest thing that we're focusing on right now is um, community-based and community-grounded responses so that it's a little bit more um, localized. And we've been hosting several webinars as well so that we're you know, moving this information into a virtual space where people across the globe um, can attend. Um, but we're really trying to focus on um, at-home education, empowerment, resiliency, um, especially since people are, you know, very much confined to their homes. Yeah. Before, uh, let me ask you the last question because of, uh, can you share with us if you have, I don't know if you do, you know, any testimonies or uh, uh, thoughts from people who have been victims, you know, because of uh, radicalization or hate crime? Any testimony that you receive from people who have been uh, affected by this uh, situation, hate crime online or radicalization or discrimination online? Mm -hmm. Any anything that you can share with us? Um, well, I don't have a, a specific statement on hand right now, but one of the um, parent consultants for Peril, um, her son was the victim of, of a hate crime, a, 
um, a threat to his life that was posted, I believe, on, on Instagram. Um, and so she was very much involved in, in um, creating the guide and, and overview of, of the guide and also has been one of our speakers on several of the um, peril webinars. Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Bates. I appreciate what you are doing and thank you so very much. Have a wonderful day and stay safe. You too, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder to council members, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom raise hand function and we'll call on you in the order that your hand is raised. Please. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Baki. Any council member got any questions? For now, we for, for Ms. Bates. In uh, here, none. We can probably go on to the next witness then. Thank you, Ms. Bates. Okay. Thank you. Our next, our next witness is Scott Richmond from the Anti-Defamation League. Scott? We will come back to Scott as I don't see him at the moment. Um, our next witness is Michael Cohen from the Simon Wiesenthal Center. Michael, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. All right, Michael, you may start anytime. It seems that you are in mute. Michael, so you're still on mute. Give us a second to unmute you. There we go. You should be- Can you hear me? Yep. Great, thank you so much. My name is Michael Cohen, and I am the East Coast Director of the Simon Wiesenthal Center. With a constituency of over 400,000 families, including approximately 150,000 in the East, in the tri-state in the tri-state area, the Wiesenthal Center stands as a global human rights organization confronting anti-Semitism, hate, bigotry and terrorism, while promoting human rights and dignity for all. Mr. Chairman, thank you so much for providing the Wiesenthal Center an opportunity to address the Committee on Civil and Human Rights on the critical issues of online hate and radicalization. Firstly, I want to thank the many members of the Council for using their portions of their Digital Inclusion Initiative resources in this past budget cycle for exactly the purpose of this oversight hearing, ensuring that our next generation is aware of the online hate directly targeting them and preparing them with the skills necessary to be active partners in combating online hate. We are experiencing in real time how hate marketed 24 seven on social media plays an outsized role in increasing both radicalization and in inspiring the increasing hate crimes on our streets. This impact is only amplified since the outset of the COVID-19 pandemic. As many of you are aware, the Wiesenthal Center's Digital Terrorism and Hate Project, which thanks to the foresight of the council, will now be conducting our nationally renowned workshops in New York City public middle and high schools throughout the five boroughs. The Wiesenthal team will help empower our city's youth to identify and reject the surge of online bigotry and instead embrace our city's diversity and our maxims of tolerance and mutual respect. Our institution's senior researchers daily monitor trends of online hate, and the Wiesenthal Center regularly meets with social media giants to demand the removal of hate and haters from their powerful platforms. We have prepared a booklet which has been distributed digitally to all members of the council, which displays the scope of online hate and radicalization targeting our children and our communities. The Wiesenthal Center once again would like to thank the members of both the council and this important committee for recognizing the importance of this issue and for partnering with us in an effort to provide our local communities with additional resources necessary to directly join on the front lines in the fight against online hate. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. Uh, I want to take uh, the opportunity to thank you for what you and Simon Rosenthal have been doing. I know that you are doing a wonderful job in bringing people together going to the school and bringing, you know, and, uh, and, and bringing the children and all people from all the different backgrounds together and also in instilling 
and the children, the spirit of collaboration, respect, and the unity. Thank you very much. And I had the opportunity also to be part or to attend to several uh, events from uh, Simon Rosenthal, and I was uh, really impressed, uh, you know, by what I have seen. Thank you so very much. And I think that we had uh, a, a forum also in the city council in the blue room, and we had several uh, uh, rabbis and member of the Jewish community and member of other community also, different community coming together to address this uh, issue. Thank you for that is what you have been doing and we continue to do that because uh, at this time we are seeing a divided city, divided nation, divided uh, uh, society and community. We have to come together as people, as society, that means government, uh, uh, non-profit organization, you know, people. We have to come as a society to make sure we, 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 we promote uh, respect, collaboration and unity among people. And that will make New York City a better place for all. Thank you so very much. And uh, let me ask you one thing, uh, Michael. Can you share with us cases, uh, example of uh, hate crime, uh, hate crime or nation or radicalization that uh, your organization has been discovered or uh, uh, experiences? Sure. And, and Councilman, first of all, thank you very much, you know, for, for your kind words. Um, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm blessed to personally know your dedication to these issues. I remember when we first met, uh, you were running an organization called Youth for Education and Sports, which specifically worked to bring people and our next generation together, specifically to fight the, anti, the, the all, all of the kinds of hate that we now see today. Um, and it's great to see that you're on the front lines here. Um, recognizing with the committee the importance of fighting it online and the digital experiences that we're seeing. So really thank you for all of your efforts, uh, first and foremost. Um, but secondly, as, as, you, as you said, we are constantly seeing uh, a direct line drawn between what we're seeing online and what we're seeing on the streets. Um, you know, we have seen all, you know, time and time again, um, you know, people once they've been um, apprehended for a hate crime, um, trying to say that they believed a certain kind of thing because they saw it online, because they believed it online. Um, you know, there, there, was, there was an instance um, that we dealt with uh, just uh, in the early parts of the pandemic where you had a city council member um, in, in, uh, just across the river in New Jersey um, who ended up saying some things online saying some things that were derogatory against a number of different communities. And when questioned about it, young council person, he was 29 years old, his response was, well, this is what I saw online. This is what I saw in all of these kinds of instances. And once, once there, was a, there was an opportunity to discuss that and to see what was real and what was not, it was so readily apparent that unfortunately everybody is susceptible to what they're seeing online, particularly in the COVID-19 pandemic, when we're so much interacting with our with our digital, uh, with our with, with just digitally on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, one of the other things that we see constantly, which is affecting our children, is also the dramatic increase of interactive online gaming. I saw with my own children watching one of my kids playing a game of pool online and seeing Team Hitler. With a little, with a little uh, uh, Hitler sign um, and, a, and a face of that individual, um, trying to say, you know, let's win one, and we can bet on how many Jews we can kill. These are the kinds of things and, and the kinds of methodologies that those who hate are trying to use. They're very creative, and they're always a step ahead. So we have to make sure to um, to be right on, right, right behind them, and have these kinds of hearings, and have the kind of programs that we have to make sure that. We are helping our next generation identify these issues and make sure they recognize that we're here to help them and what reporting they can do to help take some of those things off of the social media. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. Uh, I know that also you are a legislator also. People don't know that. And you have been in uh, government for a long period of time. But uh, what policies have you seen are most effective in combating online crime. 
So what is we there see any policy that you see that? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Is there any policy that you you have seen that that is effective in combating you know online hate crime and uh, discrimination? Well, absolutely. I, I I think that the most critical piece we can do is making is two things. First of all, making sure that our educators in our schools understand a, a clear definition of what crosses the line and what and what is unacceptable and what is considered hateful. Uh, we've seen time and again uh, school administrators or, or teachers or people in the education world seeing something in their classrooms and later saying they didn't know. So we need to make sure that, that our educators are, are very clearly um, educated themselves into what hate is and what hate crimes are and what hate speech is. We also need to make sure, and this is something that the Wiesenthal Center uh, with your help and the work and the help of your colleagues is, is able to do, is go into schools directly and make sure that as young as middle school and even earlier now, unfortunately, that we have the tools necessary to teach that just because you see something online, just because you see something on social media, doesn't mean it's true. We've seen, for instance, about a year and a half ago, uh, we saw when, when you had a, a white supremacist group was taking images of Taylor Swift and trying to take profile pictures with her holding up a Nazi salute, which what appeared to be that, which were all doctored. And then all of a sudden you had people who appreciated her art and then thinking, well, if it's okay for her to be a white supremacist, then it might be okay. But we knew that they were doctored. But the question is, is how do you educate an 11 year old or a 12 year old to make sure that they understand that that is something that you have to question every, if it doesn't seem right, they need to question that. So we have put our programs and our workshops into New York City public schools and into schools throughout the region and around the country to make sure that kids as young as middle school have workshops to learn how to identify what is hate and what is things that appear irregular are really irregular, and also to empower them. Because one of the things you hear from educators throughout is that we need to make sure that our young people understand that they have a social responsibility to be part of the answer to that problem. So we actually have also, which we distribute a, uh, an app, which allows for a student, if they see something like that, allows for something somebody as young as a 10 or 11 year old to anonymously put into an app, I think this is hateful. I think this is wrong. And for it to get checked out and for us to look at it, and if it's wrong for us to go to the appropriate social media platform and try to fight to make sure it's taken off. So it's about social teaching social empowerment to our next generation and also making sure that they understand how to properly identify what they see, whether it's hateful or whether it's real or whether it's something that they need to report. Uh, Michael, I, I know that uh, Simon Rosenthal has uh, published, uh, you know, a report card, you know, very important uh, document. But uh, can you give us some few details? Can you talk about the report card? You know, issues are, you know, by Simon Rosenthal every year, and uh, what has been the response to your advocacy? effort by government and the tech company, the, you know, the companies that, you know, online companies. I know that you have been in the forefront of our advocacy to make sure that those companies understand that they are to be part of this effort. What has been the response, you know, by the government and by those company? And also, if you want, can you tell us about the report card also? Sure, so as you, as you know, we, we each year, have a come out with a, uh, a a report card, which you know I believe it was two years ago uh, you hosted a press conference at City Hall with us, um, demonstrating the report card that dem that shows specifically a letter grade for each of the social media platforms and how they are doing in combating hate, racism, bias, and all of the kinds of things that we're talking about today. And you know, 20 years ago when we first started this, this program of, of demonstrating on, via a letter grade, their efforts. At first they were closing their doors on us. They didn't want to hear from, from these kinds of things. But suddenly the PR of them seeing, I got an F on how I deal with racism, or I got an F on how I deal with, so, with, 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 with online hate. 
And then when direct lines were shown, when folks were posting after a hate crime, all kinds of things about trying to show, look why they did it on their platforms. Those kinds of things put pressure. Because it's very hard with the free speech arguments to put legal pressure in certain ways. And yes, there is a distinction between hate speech and free speech, which we have to be very careful of. And there are increasingly specific definitions of, of different kinds of hate, which can be used in those regards. But a lot of it is the commercial pressure and the public pressure. And what government officials like yourself have done is to make sure that those kinds of instances where, let's say, when we do a report card, which can highlight either their lack of effort or their increased effort on those matters, where it gets highlighted, where it gets publicity, where it gets recognized, so that they feel that from even a shareholder perspective, that they have to listen. And also doing that with elected officials show them, and these kinds of hearings show them, that if they don't self-police, that we're going to have to help police for them with other regulations, which they don't want. So exactly these kinds of hearings and those kinds of efforts uh, really are helpful. What we have seen is in efforts such, so, such as Facebook, where Facebook now you know, has a team that specifically deals with these kinds of matters. So when people report to our team you know, about, about a hate crime or about a hate site or about something of that nature, we now have relationships with people who are specifically designated at some of those social media platforms to be able to make sure that they not just understand that they need to take down hate speech, but that they understand the nuances of things that are being posted and why they are considered hate speech when perhaps they didn't even realize themselves. So those kind of increased relationships, the fact that some of those social media platforms that are more responsible are starting to design those kinds of, of either committees or workshops or, or teams um, has been something positive. Uh, one of the things though that we have seen is, is with each advancing advance in that regard, that new platforms come up that have less regulations. So it's a constant flow of making sure that we're dealing with those that we find uh, hate speech on, and also having our research team, which we do constantly, look up on new social media platforms that pop up and make sure that we continue to put the pressure on them and make sure that we continue to advertise and show that they exist to responsible folks like everybody at this hearing today. Thank you so very much, Michael, and thank you for what uh, Simon Rosenthal and yourself and your staff are doing to ensure that people can live in New York City with peace of mind without any fear of being uh, insulted or discriminated or disrespected because of their race, religion, or, or their belief or sexual orientation. Thank you so very much. And uh, is there any question for my colleagues, for Michael? I see no um, raised hands. So we can All right. Our next witness. Thank you so very much, Mike. Mike. Councilman, thank you so much for your partnership, your help, and your dedication to this critical issue. Thank you very much, and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. I would now like to welcome Scott Richmond from the Anti Defamation League. Scott, you may begin your testimony when you're ready. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, my name is Scott Richmond. I'm the regional director for ADL, the Anti-Defamation League. Uh, my office oversees the work of this international organization in New York and New Jersey. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify here today regarding the rising tide of hate and extremism online and what we as New Yorkers can do about it. Uh, I will start by pointing out a, a survey conducted by ADL just before uh, COVID-19 that lays out the problem. It found that 44% of American adults have experienced online harassment and 28% have experienced severe online harassment. This includes stalking, physical threats, swatting, and doxing. Uh, further, more than one in three people harassed online believe that they were targeted because of their identity characteristics. And since COVID, things have only see, uh, seem to have only gotten worse. Uh, we've seen a surge in online hate targeting Asian American and Pacific Islanders, as well as Jewish communities, fueled by conspiracy theories, bigotry and racism, post after post, have blamed uh, Orthodox and Haredi Jews for the coronavirus, called on law enforcement to use water hoses and tear gas to stop Haredi and Orthodox community members from gathering, and suggested that the Jewish community should be denied health care entirely if they become sick. 
even outside the context of COVID-19, the increased uh, national polarization, divisive rhetoric, and so social unrest uh, leading up to the 2020 election really provided fertile ground for extremists to spread misinformation and disinformation and to sow division and fear. Day after day, extremist groups continue to press their hateful ideology on social media, on message boards, on video sharing sites, and through online games. Uh, it's something we, we often overlook, but the gaming community has become a very oppressive place. And it's often with tangible offline consequences and few social media companies seem equipped or willing to address it in a meaningful way. Uh, the public uh, is really expecting bold action. Uh, according to a 2020 online hate survey across all political uh, ideologies, the vast majority of Americans make this clear. So what can this commission do to help? I I'll lay out uh, uh, four uh, ways that I think the commission can help. One, um, the commission could, should ensure that there are clear protocols and procedures in place to identify and respond to actionable conduct online. An online threat is as much a threat as a verbal one, stoking fear, silencing voices, and causing harm to people's emotional, physical, and professional safety, all of which have a serious and lasting effect on victims and their families. Second, the commission must use its pulpit, its bully pulpit, to condemn biased and bigoted online rhetoric in the strongest possible terms. Silence can signal acceptance, further emboldening those responsible for causing harm. Third, the commission should provide vocal support for ongoing efforts to strengthen and improve New York's cyber hate laws pertaining to swatting and doxing, particularly in cases where individuals are targeted based on protected characteristics. This will help send a clear and unequivocal message that this conduct is both unacceptable and unwelcome in our state. And finally, we urge the commission to join ADL and thousands of others in urging social media platforms like Facebook to meet the demands of the Stop, Stop Hate for Profit Coalition um, by adopting common sense changes to their policies that will help stem radicalization and hate. The Stop Hate for Profit Coalition was uh, started by ADL along with the NAACP, Color for Change and other organizations and has managed to make great strides in getting uh, uh, Facebook to change its policies regarding online hate. I can go into more details on that if you want. Um, and that's, that's really the, the four recommendations. And I thank you for your time and attention to this critical issue. We look forward to continuing to serve as a resource for the commission uh, as it works to ensure that New York City is a safe, welcoming and inclusive city for all, both online and off. Thank you so very much, Mr. Richman. And thank you also for what ADL has been doing you know, to address the issues of online hate and discrimination. Uh, mentioned in your testimony, see, harassment and severe harassment. Can you elaborate on the distinction, the difference between harassment and severe harassment? So what I'm trying to look uh, for is the impact of certain cases of harassment or not harassment on the behavior and the psychology of people. How you know, severe harassment can modify, can affect people in the community, if you want. Look, the problem with cyber harassment is that everybody sees it. Uh, you know, it's not just that you feel it because you feel oppressed, but that that it's very, very visible. It's very public. I mean, it's as if you've published that in the newspaper or, more, or much more than that. I mean, it has a global audience. It could be shared. Uh, you know, if a person is harassed in their workplace, it could be that only you and the person harassing you know that. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very limited. And then other people can join in, pile on. Uh, it's uh, obviously cyber harassment has many, many more implications. People can make all sorts of uh, assumptions about you. And then it, it could involve doxing, you know, where the person's name is given out, address is given out, uh, family members. Uh, we saw a terrible case in, uh, in Boston over the past few weeks where a person uh, uh, was driving past, I don't know if you know about this, was driving past a Trump rally and screamed out, uh, the, their child in the back seat, opened the window, screamed out uh, something at the Trump supporters. The Trump supporters took a photo 
of, uh, of this boy who was nine years old and then proceeded to uh, publish the boy's name, the school that this boy goes to, the parents' names, the parents' workplaces, and they were shamed terribly online, uh, all because of the actions of a nine-year-old boy. And that sort of stuff lives on forever. It's not as if that can be erased from, uh, from social media. It's there, and, and we're talking about a nine-year-old boy. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned also in your testimony that uh, uh, the government uh, should uh, come with clean protocol and uh, commission and also support for local initiative. Can you elaborate a little bit about that? I'm sorry, say that again? Uh, you mentioned about uh, you know, uh, bringing protocol, you know, using protocol, the government should uh, should uh, bring a protocol to use a certain protocol, establish ah. certain protocol, and also provide support to local initiative. Right. So that was about clear protocols and procedures to yeah. respond to uh, to uh, actionable conduct online. Uh, so it's it's a question of you know what happens when there is an issue of harassment. Um, you know who is this reported to? How does that that conduct get uh, remedied? Uh, there should be very clear protocols which are outlined so that people know what to do and uh, and people within government know how to uh, to proceed when they when they get these allegations. Thank you very much. Uh, and also can you tell us also uh, our hate group, monetize the ideologies online. What effects have been made to demonetize hate crime online? You know, are they, you know, get the profit, you know, using the hate crime online? Are they, you know, the genuine profit or benefit from that? So I, I think you may be referring to the Stop Hate for Profit uh, initiative, which, uh, which ADL started with the NAACP and Color for Change. The idea is that uh, obviously, the more users that uh, social media has, uh, the more successful they are. Um, therefore, they're they're profiting. I mean, that's that's the basic idea. And we our our premise is that social media is profiting from the use of their platform for hate which exists on, on their platform. And, and just to elaborate on what the Stop Hate for Profit Coalition is, uh, so, so this coalition uh, following uh, George Floyd, uh, the murder of George Floyd, pressed Facebook to remove hate speech from uh, its platform. It refused to do so. And this coalition uh, pressed companies, and in the end it was 1,200 companies top companies, Kellogg's, Levi's, The Gap, et cetera, into uh, uh, removing their advertising from Facebook uh, in the months of July and August. It was a, a very successful campaign. Uh, when we started the Stop Pay for Profit Coalition, we didn't have a single corporation that had signed on to it. And uh, you know, we're talking at the end of June. And very quickly, these companies signed on to it and said, you know, we, we don't agree with this. Uh, and that resulted, and we, we had outlined several, uh, several steps that Facebook needed to take, and, and they began to take those steps, but it was not enough. Uh, so then in September, we asked for a freeze of Instagram. So Instagram is owned by Facebook, and uh, Instagram is, of course, populated by uh, many celebrities, uh, led by Sasha Baron Cohen, uh, who has been uh, very vocal on this issue. A uh, huge A-list of celebrities had uh, removed uh, or had paused their Instagram posts for one day in September. The result of all of this activity over these past few months is that uh, Facebook and, uh, decided to implement many more of the initiatives, uh, most important one being uh, the issue of, uh, of Holocaust denial I would say that a lot of this began when Facebook made the statement that they uh, would tolerate a Holocaust denial as a, as a matter of free speech. Now that's been reversed, obviously the question is, 
whether or not social media is going to uh, adhere to this, whether they're actually going to remove this, whether or not they're actually going to label this content. Uh, so that's that's been our job. Uh, especially our Center on Technology and Society. Center for Technology and Society is an entity that exists in Silicon Valley. Uh, its staff, uh, this is an ADL entity. Its staff uh, is composed of um, software engineers uh, and people who come from that world, who come from all of these different uh, social media companies. Uh, and it they, they uh, work with the social media companies when there are issues that arise, uh, not only to raise the issues with them, but to actually help them solve the issues. These are people who can code. Uh, these are people who know these systems inside and out, and they work in partnership with the social media companies to, uh, to resolve these issues uh, in a way that perhaps is, is not so uh, vocal and visible, but, but certainly helpful. Thank you very much, Mr. Richmond. We know that online uh, hate speech is a very powerful tool also used by people or groups that are involved in the uh, online uh, crime or hate. And uh, we know also uh, first, uh, the First Amendment is, uh, is a very important uh, part of our constitution, cherished by many and this sacred, you know, uh, right, I can say. But uh, what we can do to combat online hate speech without, without ruining the fall of the First Amendment? Can you comment on that? So the First Amendment says that government should not deny uh, uh, speech. It doesn't say anything about this private company denying speech. Um, it also um, doesn't mean that companies should support that hate speech. So that's really the, the impetus behind Stop Hate for Profit. Uh, the, the issue here uh, is that uh, you are a government entity. So you, know, you do have to strike that more delicate balance. Uh, it wouldn't be as if um, this commission would join the Stop Hate for Profit coalition. But uh, the, the four points that I had, uh, that I had outlined, I think uh, are very clear and do not run afoul of any First Amendment rights. Uh, the protocols, uh, when there are issues, um, speaking out against um, biased or bigoted online rhetoric is not a problem, uh, that, that uh, the government can take stands on those issues. Um, uh, and obviously swatting and doxing are uh, a major concern. Um, and I think it, it's, I, I don't see it as an issue for the government to take a stand against that, um, especially when individuals are targeted based on their protected characteristics, which, uh, you know, all of those laws um, regarding discrimination have been uh, upheld and not considered to be a free speech violation. Um, thank you very much, Mr. Richmond. I want to thank you and ADL for what you have been doing, you know, for the community and to address uh, this very crisis. And I think, uh, as I said before, it will take all of us to work together to protect people against any form of discrimination and uh, hate crime. And, uh, and this is the way we're going to create a better community, a better New York and a better environment. And again, thank you very much for what you have been doing and be safe. And uh, let's continue to work together. Thank, thank you, you so very much. Push it up. Uh, is there any question for my colleagues from Mr. Richmond? I don't see any um, raised hands. Very good. All right. Thank you, Mr. Richmond. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, at this time, if your name has not been called and you wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. As there are no raised hands, I'll now turn it back to the chair for closing remarks. Yeah, uh, but uh, before I give my closing remark, 
so I know that uh, I don't know if uh, Mike or Corinth would be willing to, you know, answer some question or give us share some some information with us. I know that you have been doing a lot of uh, outreach and effort to uh, inform the children, you know, about the hate crime online online hate crime. Uh, can you, Michael, tell us uh, if you are willing to do so? Because I, I've been asking you so many questions already. Uh, what the government, what government and teachers and parents can do to protect the children against online hate crime, especially now when the children uh, spend more time online, you know, with this uh, crisis. I know you mentioned a lot of things already. Is there anything you want to add in terms of, you know, uh, uh, working we working together? That means we, government, parents, and organization to ensure that at this very difficult where where technology is the key, you know, and our children and not only children, all of us we spend so, uh, more time on you know online, you know, in, in a remote you know system than anything. Can is there anything that you can you know, share with us in terms of working together to text, especially the children. Sure, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you a, 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 a quick story, uh, which I think is, is very indicative of, of one thing parents can do. Um, after one of our days that we had a workshop in, in, a, in, a, in a public school in, in Brooklyn uh, about a year ago, about a year, year and a half ago, um, we ended up afterwards having parents around to hear from the students that were in those workshops all day and to get a sense of what their children felt about those workshops and what they felt about online hate. And the first question that the moderator that we had there uh, made sure to ask was to the parents, who's on Facebook? And so every parent raised their hand and then he asked the children, well, who are, these are middle school children and high school children. Well, who are you on Facebook? And one kid raised their hand in the entire uh, amount of students there. And the parents were very surprised that none of them raised their hand except for one student. So we called them that student and asked him, well, why are you on Facebook? You're the only one. He goes, well, I need to have a dummy account on there so that my parents think that that's where I'm actually using my social media presence. So part of it was, was that I think parents need to be increasingly diligent as to what the newest technology, what the newest social media platforms are, what the newest platforms that are trending are. Um, you know, today it's TikTok. Uh, you know, on social gaming systems, you know, you, you, you had, you know, a year ago, everybody, you know, under the age of uh, 15 was on Minecraft, and then that shifted to other games since then. Um, you, know, I, I, you know, Fortnite and everything else. It's a constant, it's a constant making sure of a parent that they understand the, the constant evolution of what their kids are on, and constantly explaining to them what to watch out for and, and monitoring under a certain age. Um, one of the things that we believe in very much so, and we've done uh, throughout the city, is whenever we've seen a hate crime uh, that had any any kind of social media uh, piece to it, and and unfortunately, like you're saying a lot of them have a lot a lot of a lot of folks that are committing hate crimes right now. They want to they 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 want to be able to post. Um, you know, a, a whole write-up of, of why they did it to try to make sure that they could be martyrs at this point, that they can show why they did it. You know, and social media has allowed for all of these folks who want to commit hate crimes to have a venue to spread their message of hate. So part of what we've done is in those situations, we've immediately worked with members of the council, such as yourself and others, um, and gone into schools that were immediately next to those areas. So for instance, if I remember about a year and a half, about two years ago now, there was a uh, swastikas drawn in the parks in uh, Sheepshead Bay. Uh, right away, we worked at that point with council member Chaim Deutsch and went into Bay Academy, in Bay Academy uh, Middle School in Sheepshead Bay and did programs and workshops with the entire seventh grade there to educate them as to, well, what are they seeing? What are they identifying? What are the hate crimes that they're seeing? Why is what they saw in their, in their own community as they walk to school offensive? And what is their social responsibility to do something about it? And a lot of folks that were in middle school, when we first asked them, what do you think your social responsibility was the second you see these kinds of things online? And their response was, I just shut it off right away to not be a part of it. And 
we, you, you, then the response is, so you realize that when you shut it off and you don't report it, or you don't talk about it, or you don't tell somebody about it, you're only leaving that person to then attack or bully the next person or your, or your peer or your colleague or your friend or your sibling. So part of it is also educating the next generation on what they can actually do as well once they do identify things of that nature. Thank you very much, Michael. Uh, Mr. Richmond, would you like to add some advices in terms of protecting I mean, it, our children? You know, I, I, I think our, uh, our neighbor, uh, New Jersey, has much to say on this issue. Uh, the Attorney General in New Jersey about a year ago uh, was made aware of the fact that there's been a, a marked increase in youth bias in New Jersey, especially uh, in the area of social media. As a result, he asked his Commission on Civil Rights to launch uh, a study of the increase in youth bias and put together recommendations. ADL helped uh, a great deal with putting together that study and the recommendations. It was all released in the past month and they came out with 27 recommendations. I think uh, when I submit the written testimony, I can submit a copy of that report. It's a hundred page report. Uh, so I can't, I can't really summarize it too well here, but I think that uh, their experience with youth bias and, and countering youth bias uh, is, is very uh, uh, important here. And I think probably the most important recommendation is doing something about um, uh, training in the schools and making it standard curriculum in the schools. They have 1600 schools in the state of New Jersey, which is approximately the same number of schools that, that exist in New York City. Uh, and making anti-bias part of the curriculum uh, is very, very important. Sensitizing students to when bias uh, exists, what is bias, how does it manifest itself, and what to do when you encounter bias, I think uh, is, is a very important uh, step for all of us to be taking. ADL does quite a bit of that work in the schools, not just in New York, but around the country. Uh, we work with the Department of Education in New York City to, uh, to implement that. And uh, that's, that's been a very important piece of our work for decades, but it's not in every school. And I think it would go a long way if we found a way to, um, uh, to do that kind of anti-bias work and make it really standard and anti-bullying for that matter. Thank you very much, Mr. Richmond. Thank you. And Michael, thank you very much. And, uh, and I thank all uh, the members of the the city and Barkey, thank you so very much. And all the members uh, of the staff of the uh, Civil and Human Rights Committee, thank you. And let me conclude by saying that, that it is our moral responsibility as society, as uh, people, as a city, to come together to do everything that we can do to make sure that everyone can be respected, regardless of race, religion, affiliation, and socioeconomical situation. Everyone has the right to live in New York City with respect and dignity. And uh, hate crime, online hate crime, is a reality, it's something very powerful that affects so many people. And when people are affected by crime or uh, online discrimination, they can be traumatized for life. That can disturb the life, not only their life, but also life of the members of the family. That can break families also. Mental issue is a very, very powerful, powerful and also negative situation and on any human being. And I think that uh, it is our moral responsibility, responsibility. We have all to come together to make sure we combat, we eliminate any type of online crime or hate, any type of discrimination online or not. And, and, uh, any form of discrimination. And I commend all of you for what you have been doing. And we have to continue to work together, especially to protect the children. Because we say that the children are the future of the city, the future of the society. They are going to be what we create on them. They are going to be you know, the positive citizen, the proactive citizen if we make the effort to instill in them the intrinsic values, the respect of people. But if we don't do that, they will train the other groups to continue to create, to 
and power to implement, to make it online a crime more powerful and more difficult also to eliminate. So to all of you, thank you so very much. Have a wonderful day, be safe, and may God bless you all. Thank you so much. With that, the meeting is adjourned.